Our next speaker is Sky Christofferson. He is an Olympic cyclist. He is um, a world record holder. He is a digital health expert. And he is the happiest man I know. Please come to the stage, Sky. Disgraced cycling superstar Lance Armstrong stripped of his medals. You have Sarah Hammer, Jenny Reed, Dotsie Bosch, Lauren Tamayo, who were attempting to do the impossible, win the first U.S. Women's Track Cycling medal in 20 years. When there's this cause that's larger than you, these four athletes who really need help, you can't say no. Five, four! You're either going to walk out of that stadium knowing that we were going to have an Olympic medal or not. Everything was going to be stacked against us, but you had to do one perfect ride, and that's what we were being trained to do. Really, we were up against a Goliath. We're flying to Spain to set them up with self-tracking that will go beyond traditional sports science. Athletes need a huge amount of support. We didn't have enough people or enough time. It's like, you put all this work into this, get fun, buddy. We've been up, we've been down, we can do it. We don't know if we can catch the rest of the world. Anything you put your heart and soul into, anything's possible. Thank you, it's like, then we across the wall. Oh, just so proud. I can't, I can't tell you. Woo! All right. Hey, Stanford, how are you guys doing today? <laughs> and Lisa, there's a reason that I'm the happiest guy you know, and that's because after 20 years of struggling as an athlete with no medals and dealing with doping and all of these other issues, we finally had a success story here. So I'd just like to sort of illustrate uh, an, an, an example, a sports-specific example from what Monir, you know, these hundreds of medals uh, that Monir outlined. I'd like to kind of give you a very intimate, behind-the-scenes look into uh, the journey towards just one medal. Okay, so I was a velodrome cyclist, and this is an indoor sport, much like uh, swimming or track and field, you have 10 medal opportunities available. And from a scientific perspective, it really is the ultimate controlled environment. And uh, I was personally on the US cycling team in the late 90s, and that's Chris Carmichael there on the right side. And this is, he was Lance Armstrong's coach, so we, we shared the same coach, this, this was our team. And going into the 96 Olympics, uh, this, I was part of what they called Project 96, and this still is one of the most well-funded innovation projects to, to make sure that the U.S. athletes went into those games with the, the best technology. And this is the Superbike 2, so this was this radical, you know, boomerang-shaped bike that they made. It was the most aerodynamic bike in history. It was actually so much so they, the International Committee banned it right, out, right after the Olympics. It was a little bit too fast, yeah. So um, while we had this incredible equipment and technology in these areas, one thing we could not do very well, just, just as Munir mentioned, was understand how the athletes were responding as unique individuals. We just didn't have the technology at that point. The model was based around this training program. It was uh, Eastern Bloc inspired. It was you know, very challenging, high volume, high intensity. And this works great if you have enough athletes that you can push through, or if you have enough drugs, right? To, to, to sort of boost their performance, but if you don't, it can be very frustrating because it's, it's this template, this very rigid template model. So I retired actually very frustrated. After the Sydney Olympics, uh, you know, there was, there was doping happening in, on, in our team, and just to be clear, this had nothing to do with the Olympic Committee. This was all cycling specific, and a very specific group of men. Uh, who were involved with this doping crisis, but you know all the dominoes fell, and we'll, we'll, we'll see you know that inside look at that in a second here. But I retired, and I just wanted to put sport behind me. I just wanted to be done with it. It was so frustrating when you're when you're not doping. Look, these guys are in a completely different world, and when the training's not being adjusted for you, you're continually getting sick. 
you're getting injured, you're going home every day, and you're just thinking, what is wrong with me? Like, I am not good enough as a person. You, and and that, the impact of that is, is very deep. So, you know, I went to school at UCSD, started a tech company up in Seattle, and, you know, wanting to put that athlete focus towards the startup world, I was like, okay, I'm just, I'm going to, you know, participate in this all-nighters, you know, bad diet, all of these sort of badges of honor, you know, of the startup culture when you're, quote, you know, going for it or doing it right. And uh, my body did not handle that very well. Uh, I was, one thing I wanted to note, that it's interesting, in business, all of the KPIs are around the business itself. And they had nothing to do with the founders or the employees or the contractors. And I mean, I know that's common sense to everyone else, but I thought that was remarkable. Like how can the key metrics not be around the health and performance of the people starting this business when you're looking at sustainability? So, I mean, I, this crescendoed in a ride in an ambulance to the ER, which I can tell you was terrifying. Uh, it was a heart attack scare. I had these pains in my chest. I was completely you know, stressed out. The doctor that I saw put me through a full CT scan, heart attack workup. Uh, they said I was, I, was, I was cleared as having good health. Uh, but literally in a, in a two minute conversation, you know, this doctor, had this list of drugs. You know, here's how to get your blood pressure down. Here's how to lower your anxiety. And it was this list of pharmaceutical drugs. And I felt like there I was, right back where I left sport. You know, where you had this group of guys who's saying, oh, it's tough, you're getting sick, you, you know, you're, you're not responding. Here, take some of these pills. Here, inject some of this. I felt like I was right back at that same moment. Remarkable. I thought there's, there's got to be some better way here. So somewhat serendipitously, I was down in San Diego, and a lot of you know this guy, Dr. Eric Topol. Now, he was talking about this data-driven health revolution, and, you know, this, this called living by numbers. And have you ever been, at, you know, you're at a conference, and there's a new idea, and you're, you're kind of on the edge of your seat, like, oh, my God, this is it, this is it. That's the way I felt with Dr. Topol, and I talked, I approached him right after the conference, and I said, hey, you know, we, we need to do something here. So we talked about, we, we came together and did a, a one-year experiment. So my goal was just to get my health back, right? And the idea was gonna be to quantify sleep, diet, exercise, and well-being, and see if, you know, maybe not only get the health back, but also improve work performance. So I started doing this, and uh, wow, there's a slide missing, sorry. There, you'll see the equipment that I used in, in a little bit here. But basically, I, I, I not only got my health back, you know, all these symptoms reversed, hun dozens of different symptoms. That was a, a blessing in itself. But I also started cycling again. And funny enough, I was doing times better than in my 20s. Uh, using this data, this data-driven model, and and this culminated in a world record. Uh, there was the 30 years and older, and the previous holder of this record had a lifetime ban for performance-enhancing drugs. So this sort of pointed to the possibilities here of you know this this new model. So there would be no Olympics for me. They weren't they weren't sending a men's team. So th th this this was the model, by the way. So really, you put the athlete at the center. Just just as Monir mentioned, this has been the shift that we've seen re you know in recent years, and you support them or you empower them with data, data and of course you know personal support. That's really the new model. The challenge is that can be expensive. It requires a lot of staff. You know, Great Britain did this at the, the Olympics before London, and they invested uh, $40 million over their quad, some, something like that, and had a huge staff. So in trying to, okay, so here's, this, here's where the underdog story starts, all right? So I got pulled into this because this, this girl here, Jenny Reed, was my teammate as a sprinter. And she said, hey, we're going to try to go for a medal in this new women's event called the Team Pursuit. And they had a, st a stage racer, a sprinter, Sarah Hammer, who was a world champion pursuiter, and then Lauren Tamayo, who was also a, a road cyclist. So they had never ridden together in the Olympics. And they were, at that point, they were half a track length behind the leading teams. And this was three and a half months before they were going to go to Spain. And I said, you know, hey, why don't we try getting some of these new devices? Let's use some data. Let's see what we can do. And, and you know, she convinced me. We went over there. 
I think this, we, we never would have imagined that we, we arrive in this velodrome and it's the first day of practice and we walk in and nobody's there. They have, there was one staff member who was sent from a junior program in cycling. Cycling obviously had big funding issues because of Lance and these guys and the focus over, over that period. So we walk in and no one's there. So this, fortunately, this guy right here in the red hat, you know, all the, all the women had their husbands with them. You know, these are older athletes, they had the husbands. And these guys, I think, thought that they were gonna be there for you know, vacation, like, hey, we're just gonna kind of cheer our wives on as they train. I think uh, little did they know, you know, we, we had to put them to work, you know, and they had to learn how to uh, change the gears, how to massage, how to cook clean. I mean, these guys did everything. It's kind of like, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That pyramid, you, gotta, you have to build the foundation first at the bottom, and then you can work up to the higher level stuff. So these guys were amazing, and you can see it in the film Personal Gold, these guys, or just awesome. So where this really became kind of this extraordinary situation, right, is Lance Armstrong, so, so we got a phone call. We're there in the velodrome training. We get a phone call. The coach said, all the men are out. These guys just withdrew. Nobody knew why. And like a week later, we found out that all those dominoes fell. And, you know, George Hincapie, Christian Vanneveld, Lance Armstrong, these guys, were banned. They, they couldn't compete in London. They agreed just, just to withdraw. So internally, you know, we really felt the metal pressure start shifting onto this group of, of women. Yet we're there and, you know, we had very, very little staff or resource. So we had to figure out quick how we were going to do this. This just shows the expanse of the doping problem, enormous in, in men's road cycling. So these were some of the devices I used and, and new stuff that we, we brought over there to Spain. Uh, this is the kind of, so this was our quantified self you know, toolkit here. Uh, so we started off, we, we started off with sleep tracking because this is, I think, the biggest opportunity for athletes to recover. And as Monir said, like Michael Phelps, you know, you're not just being forced through a template anymore especially with older athletes like we had with these women, you really have to fine tune on a daily basis. And I think sleep is one of the best ways to do that. If you look, we used the Zio headband, so we were getting EEG from the forehead, right? To look at these deep sleep numbers, we found the deep sleep was key. This is what we're using now. This is a MFIT QS. This, this is a strip sensor that goes under the mattress. It's non-contact. This is measuring every heartbeat and every breath of the athlete overnight. And what we're able to do with that is get a heart rate variability delta. So overnight, eight or nine hours, you're getting an HRV delta. We've seen many cases already where this delta is supposed to go up when your body's regenerating. If, it's, if it goes down, it can be an early warning indicator for not only overtraining, but also illness. In one case, two days before someone got the flu, they, the, the, the HRV delta went negative. And, uh, before they had any conscious awareness of symptoms. Two days later, they, they got the flu. So, so this, this kind of technology here is remarkable. We observed, this, this is an average over these months, a, a, a drop in deep sleep. And any guesses as to why it would drop, you know, week to week into the spring like this? Any guesses? Sun? Cl close. Stress? Possible, yes. Good ideas. None of those, nope. So we, we were very curious about this. So we kept an eye on this. We also uh, started looking at a lot of other continuous data streams. Uh, blood glucose, CGM is something we use. So we were able to see the athletes fueling through the day. And uh, this, this was remarkable because usually you had to do a periodic you know, um, finger prick. And if, if you're looking at someone overnight, you can't wake the athlete up and be like, hey, we gotta take a measurement. You know, so these, these continuous uh, less or non-invasive streams were, are very, you can see right here in uh, overnight, they were dropping very low under 50. And this is, you know, qualifies as hypoglycemia. So uh, recovery opportunities there, you know, by fueling a little bit more, showing them the data because athletes are always afraid of getting fat and overeating. But if you can, if you can show them this and, and time the meals better, that's something that we, we, we saw some good results with. So these, these were put into these, you know, these are sort of standard X, Y, uh, nonlinear regressions is just a different way of looking at it here. We were there, you know, we had all this data from these different devices on, on our laptop, and the laptop started freezing up. 
we, we didn't have the ability to even process this data anymore to really start looking for the insights. So a company here in Silicon Valley called Datamere actually helped us out. We sent them all our data. They analyzed, they put this stuff into, this is the, the, probably the coolest way of looking at it is a circular relationship diagram. So you can see how these data sets are interconnected, you know, this multivariate analysis. And one of the strongest connections we saw was between deep sleep and room temperature. So did anyone say, say room temperature on that? So the, the, the reason it was dropping, the room was getting hotter and hotter as we were getting close to the summer. And you know, I mean, we, we can feel this, right? You know those, those summer nights where you just, you wake up and you don't feel, quite feel refreshed. Uh, you feel kind of, you know, kind of groggy. So what it is is finding just the right sleeping temperature and slow, you know, stage four slow wave sleep, that's human growth hormone, that's testosterone, that was a very powerful way. And I think you might see the results on the next, this, this is actually how we did it. So the most effective way to drop core temperature is the, that contact uh, point of the mattress. So this is the uh, chili pad, and it circulates cooled water on a mattress topper underneath the athlete. I still use this every night because it's a, it's a, huge, it's a huge difference. And you see, here's post-intervention. Chili pad, it's set, in this case, at 66 degrees. You see the difference in, in deep sleep there. And even with the margin of error, I mean, that was, that was pretty remarkable. So we did this with all of the athletes. And subjectively, subjectively even, they reported feeling, feeling much better. Okay, so, and we had a, we had a variety of different interventions. That, um, from the blood biomarker test we did to psychometrics, subjective inventory, all parts of that data model that came together. So, <laughs> the Olympics are coming up in a month. We needed more time, and actually the girls were joking like they could just call up the uh, organizers and ask them to postpone it a little bit because we, <laughs> we needed a little bit more time. Uh, but you know, no chance of that because we're still a you know, quarter of a track length behind, huge margin behind. So we're flying into London, and this was mind blowing because you know usually cycling is kind of this this niche you, you know sport and we go into this velodrome and we find out it's the marquee event for the entire Olympics. I mean the Queen is there, Paul McCartney was there, uh, the Prince. You know and the tickets were going for like ten times the, the the cover price. It was it was kind of the place to be. And they have all these little, little tents, these little tribes set up in the middle. And you can just see these other countries with the staff members, you know, 10 staff members, all this equipment. Uh, our women, so we, when we went into the qualifying ride, they had, you know, their uniforms, these skin suits, they actually had to borrow those from the women's road team because the sizing they got, they, they were too small, right? So they didn't even have uniforms that fit, just to kind of show, you know, the, the, the contrast there. Okay, so we go into the qualifying ride, and sure enough, the, at, the, at the, the end of this three kilometer race, they, they break apart, they fall apart. And uh, it's the times taken on the third, the third woman. And the time, you know, it, it was a big improvement, but it wasn't great, but what it did do is it got us into a, a semifinal ride against Australia. And the winner of that ride would be guaranteed either a silver or a gold medal. So, so okay, great. We're, we're up against Australia. But this is Australian Institute of Sport, AIS, the very well-funded tradition of, of medals you know, in these events. So we go into this ride. And I, just, I don't know if I have a slide. I'm going to hold for one second. I'll just tell you the story, all right? This is crazy, OK? So and even I, even me as a believer, I, I thought, OK, guys, we made it this far. This was great. You know, whatever happens, happens, OK? So the, the gun goes off, and the entire stadium was packed, went silent, right? The gun went off, and sure enough, we, we're just behind from the first lap. Australia just goes out of the gate. These girls are flying. And that time can, that gap continues opening up, one and a half seconds, two seconds, two and a half seconds. And you can see it. I mean, they're, they're like back way behind over here. And, some, and usually in these events, like that doesn't reverse. You're not going to see big reversals in, in track cycling. So in the, with two laps to go, I don't know how this happened. 
that our the splits on USA started coming down. And it was like one and a half seconds, one second, 0.6 seconds, 0.4 seconds. And they were coming through the, with one lap to go. It was, it was literally like a photo finish. They were dead even. And it, even then, I thought, OK, there's no way they're going to hold this. Qualifying ride, they broke apart, lost a lot of time. So they're coming through, and they're dead even. And the crowd's just going crazy, right? I don't know how these women did it. Something happened. They found this flow. They found this sum was greater than the, the, the parts that we had, I think. Heart, God, whatever you want to call it. And they stayed together all the way around in this last lap. And they came through, again, dead even, dead even, dead even, came through. And I looked up at the <laughs> scoreboard, and USA was number one. We were at the top. But we, I thought the scoreboard was broken. Everyone was confused. Like, we're looking around, and the, the women on the track, they're cooling down, and they're confused. They're looking at each other. And then the official announcement comes, and they say, yes, United States is now guaranteed a silver or gold medal. And everyone went crazy. I mean, we were crying. People were hugging each other. And it was just this the most incredible moment of release, right? And just as Munir said, you know, that, that, those margins are so small. In this case, this was eight one hundredths of a second. And that was probably in that 0.01% range. So every little thing that we did, the husbands did, everything came together. And they, this was the first women's medal in 20 years. So this really was kind of a historic, a historic thing. So this is them here with the, the medals. And um, this gives an example of really the the human impact of this kind of technology and this kind of innovation. So I just wanted to thank you all for the work you're doing. I mean, I think we have a room full of gold medalists here. You know, a lot of this incredible innovation in these fields is happening right here in this part of the world. So keep doing this work, keep innovating, and uh, you know, let's, let's make this happen. I think there's just one quick thing here. Uh, since we've, we've done a, a project here, this is uh, called the Gold App, and basically we're putting the essential elements of what we did into, into an app, and uh, we're, we're going to be releasing that later, later this fall. So it's, it's hour to hour, and our view is that most of the tracking is very uh, reflective. It's looking back on what you've already done, and we're looking at what are your decisions in the next 10 minutes half hour, hour, because those, if you can put those you know, right, in the, right in your hand and look at your targets, what's coming up, sleeping, eating, and exercising, those are the things that have dramatic impact on your life, like at the highest level, and then filter down into whether you get chronic disease in five years or not, whether you feel amazing next month or not. And uh, I think the power really is, is on us, and it, it starts with us. And so we, we're, we're, our hope is that this app is going to empower not just Olympic athletes, but everybody to be able to do the same kind of thing. So thanks for having me.